Very good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Crescent Church. It's really good to have you with us today. This morning, we're continuing our series looking at the book of Exodus, and Tony Cullen is going to be speaking to us on chapters 7 to 9 under the title, Arguing with God. I just want to begin our time together by reading a few verses of Psalm 57, uh, just to focus our minds on the Lord. Psalm 57, verse 9 says, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples, for great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Our first song this morning is indescribable, um, and it really proclaims the greatness of our God. So let's stand and proclaim his greatness together after the introduction. Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, you truly are incomparable. You truly are our amazing God, holy, awesome, and unchangeable. And Lord, we thank you that though you are so mighty, you love people like us, people who are fragile and, and frail, people who are sinful. Lord, you do see the depths of our hearts, and you long to forgive us, and you long to save us. Thank you that that is what your character is like. And you love us to such an extent that you took on flesh and you died that we might be brought near. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the grace and mercy you've showered upon us in him. God in flesh, who bore your righteous wrath against sin so that we can be forgiven and forever welcomed into your family. And Lord, this morning we come before you uh, from lots of different circumstances, some of us joyful, some of us with heavy hearts. Lord, thank you that you know exactly where we are here this morning, and you love us and you care for us. And Lord, many of us this morning do come with heavy hearts, given some of the images we've seen on our TV screens of yet another conflict erupting in our broken world. And Lord, we do ask that you might bring justice to the land of Israel and Palestine. Lord, we do ask that you might bring down terrorists and liberate those who've been taken hostage. We do ask, Lord, that that conflict might be brought to a swift conclusion and that you might prevent further loss of life. We ask that the Christians in that region might be protected and that they may, might be bold in declaring the gospel. We pray that the message of the gospel might transform lives and hearts in that land turning enemies into brothers and sisters. We thank you that the gospel has the power to bring about that sort of transformation. But we also ask for wisdom for the leaders in that place as they seek to respond to this crisis. And we pray for Christian organizations on the ground as they seek to show the love of Christ in a place of so much hate. Father, we ask for your blessing upon our church family here at Crescent. There are many activities and initiatives that have started up in the past few weeks, and we particularly pray for the youth and kids' work here at Crescent. We ask that you might give our youth and kids' leaders wisdom and energy for this really significant gospel work. Would you bless them? We ask it. We also pray, Father, for the Marriage Matters course that is starting this week. We know that you really care about the state of our marriages, and we ask that you might use this course to strengthen and enrich marriages here at Crescent. May those involved in that course grow in their love for Christ and for one another. Finally, Lord, we pray for Tony as he opens up your word to us this morning. We ask that you might help him to boldly declare your truth. And as he does so, please, Lord, would you make our hearts ready to respond appropriately to all that you're teaching us through it. And we pray all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Just a few notices. Uh, now this evening, Tim Graham is going to be preaching at the start of a new series in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Tim's going to be speaking on chapters 1 and 2 of Matthew under the title, The Coming of Jesus. Our ladies' Bible study, uh, Monday morning Bible study, is going to commence tomorrow at 10.15 a.m., and then they meet on alternate weeks uh, thereafter. Uh, they're going to be meeting in the Crescent Cafe, and this term they're looking forward to studying uh, the letter to the Philippines. Uh, Wednesday, as I mentioned in prayer, marks the start of our four-week Marriage Matters course. Uh, it's a course designed to help enrich and strengthen the marriages here at Crescent. Um, and please, would you be praying for that course and for all involved in it, that God uses it to bless those attending. And if you're interested in being involved in a, in a similar course down the line, please come and speak to, to myself or to one of the elders here at Crescent. This Thursday, there will be our regular prayer meeting at 8 p.m. That takes place in the minor hall, just out the back here. And we'll be joined by Steve Ludwig, who works for Pioneers UK. Steve's going to share a little bit about the work he's been doing. And we'll also have the chance to pray with and for Reuben Johnson, who's heading off to volunteer with CMI Aid in Moldova shortly. So do join us for that. October's mission of the month is focused on supporting our commended missionary, Heather Anandal, working out in South Africa. Uh, there's the opportunity to support Heather and the family next Sunday. There'll be boxes uh, out the back, and you can also give online uh, by earmarking your gifting. Heather's also going to join us on Zoom at our prayer meeting on the 26th of October, um, so do come along to that as well. 
I'm reliably informed that there's just 80 days until Christmas, uh, which is terribly exciting. Um, and with that in mind, it's time to start gathering items together for our shoebox appeal, a really significant ministry facilitated by Samaritan's Purse, the chance to send out uh, gifts to uh, children who are in difficult situations across the world. Um, we're having a packing party on Saturday the 11th of November, uh, a chance for some fellowship and to serve the Lord in this way. Uh, so do get that date in your diary. Saturday the 11th of November, a packing party for Samaritan's Purse. Next Sunday morning, Danny Crooks is going to continue our series in Exodus. He's going to be preaching from chapters 9 and 10 under the title Resisting Evidence. And then in the evening, Ben Sullivan will continue our series in Matthew. Uh, Ben's going to be speaking on chapter 3 under the title Introducing Jesus. Ben's talk will be especially helpful to those who aren't yet Christians. Um, it'll be an opportunity really to consider uh, some of the claims about who Jesus is. Uh, so if you have friends or family or colleagues perhaps who you know might be interested in hearing a little bit more about the Christian faith and about who Jesus is, we'd strongly encourage you to invite them along to that talk in particular. Ben's going to be aware that there'll be non-Christians present at that and will kind of preach accordingly. So do consider inviting non-Christian friends, family, and colleagues next Sunday evening. Brilliant. We're going to sing three songs back to back, so I hope you have good stamina uh, now. So we're going to stand to sing The Splendor of the King, followed by Praise to the Lord, and then Your Name. Uh, do remain standing if you're able, but if not, don't feel under any obligation. But let's stand to sing after the introduction.
thanks to the band. Uh, one more notice, a very significant one that I failed to mention, and that is that Scott Davison is officially off the market. Um, quite, yeah, quite a shock for us all, actually. But no, genuinely, Scott and Sarah were absolutely thrilled. Uh, they got engaged yesterday, I believe. Um, wonderful news. Uh, many, many congratulations. And we, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We're absolutely thrilled for you guys, and we'll be praying for you as you plan and prepare for married life. Um, Tony is, has been a drummer extraordinaire today, and now is going to come and preach. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Tony is married to Irma, and they have three children, Ethan, Ben, and Emily. Uh, Tony is one of the leaders here at Crescent, and we've been blessed with your ministry, Tony, over the years, uh, and look forward to your teaching this morning. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, it's great uh, to be here this morning, and it's also good to have uh, the CK Plus group with us, uh, who are joining our Crescent Youth here normally with us on a Sunday morning, so it's good to have you. Uh, our title uh, as we continue the series in Exodus is Arguing with God, Arguing with God. Uh, during the week, I sent out a question to uh, the Crescent Youth group, and this was the question and some clues, who am I? And I was thinking of a country. Who am I? I am a world superpower with a powerful head of state. I am a nation of advanced technology and infrastructure. I have incredible natural resources and a large skilled workforce. I worship the gods of pleasure, personal beauty, prosperity, and entertainment. And the votes are back from the CY poll, if we can have the first slide up there. These were the countries uh, that were mentioned. We had America coming out number one with nine votes, the UK with four. Then there were three, China, Japan, and Egypt with two uh, votes each. And Israel and India came in last with one each. So I don't know if you would have voted uh, along with our Crescent Youth, but these were the results of that superpower country. They were all good answers, but most of them were about three and a half thousand years too late. Because the place that we are thinking about this morning is ancient Egypt. I'm sure many of you uh, studied about ancient Egypt in school. I remember when both uh, Ben and Ethan did their Egyptian module in uh, P5. We were making pyramid models, learning hieroglyphics. But the best part of the module was having a great excuse to make a cultural visit. A cultural visit to the Sphinx on the Strambolus Road for a tasty kebab. <laughs> Ancient Egypt was a highly developed world, world power with incredible resources. It was like many of the large nations in our 21st century. The Egyptians had everything they could possibly need. In particular, they had the Nile, the source of life, bringing food, water, and wealth. Why would they need God? In the midst of the Egyptian kingdom, there was a large group of people, the Israelites, but they were oppressed and were being forced to comply with the ways of Egypt. They were under pressure to take on the same false values and worldview. They were mocked for their belief in one true God. People were losing their freedom to worship God. Families were tempted to give up their faith and to replace faith with the values of the world around them. It sounds remarkably similar to where we find ourselves in 2023. This morning, as we consider Exodus chapters 7 to 9, I pray that we will find truths that are relevant to us in the here and now. We're going to look at a very famous but extremely dark period in the history of Egypt, but in it there is hope for people chosen by God, people who are in the midst of a trial and difficulty who trusted God and began to know Him in a far deeper way. Jim reminded us last Sunday that Pharaoh's great sin was that he defied God. He refused to accept that the world and everything in it is the Lord's. 
God was not part of Pharaoh's thinking. Pharaoh exclaimed in chapter 5, verse 2, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I do not know the Lord. Real life for Pharaoh was to invest in the here and now, to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Pharaoh scoffed at the idea of a personal God who had created us uh, for a purpose. He laughed at the hope of a promised land that we journey towards. The worldview of ancient Egypt is a lot like a modern worldview. Pharaoh and Egypt argued against the existence of the one true God. So I'm going to break uh, this morning's talk up into three parts. Part one, uh, I want you uh, to note a few general points about the plagues. And then the other two parts have the very inspiring titles of Defiled and Ruined. Defiled uh, describes plagues one to three. You may prefer to entitle it Polluted or even Stinky, which we'll see in our passage. And then Ruined will deal with plagues four to six. So that's uh, where we're going with the general points and then defiled and ruined. And I promise you, I will hopefully uh, bring in some points to challenge us and to build us up as well. So I have four uh, general points uh, about the plagues. Number one, there is a difference between the nine plagues and the final one when the firstborn were killed. The last plague was a final judgment while the first nine plagues should be viewed more like arguments. God was giving pieces of evidence to Pharaoh in an attempt to convince Pharaoh and Egypt that their rebellion should stop. God patiently begins to argue with Pharaoh that God alone is the Lord, that there is no one else like the Lord. So that's the first thing. The plagues are arguments. Throughout life, God is revealing evidence of his character uh, to us all. He has shown his creativity and beauty in the world around us, his majesty in the extent of the universe and the complexity of the human gene. Perhaps he has revealed himself to you uh, through the kindness of a Christian who has supported you when life was tough. But above all, God has revealed his character in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus loved each one of us so much that he went to the cross and he suffered for your sin and mine. He paid the price for our defiance of God and Jesus offers complete forgiveness and eternal hope to everyone. God is maybe arguing with you today. Do you know him personally as Lord? The second thing uh, to note is that the severity of the plagues is gradually increasing until the final judgment. We're going to read in chapter 7, verse 3, that God said he would multiply the signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Each plague was terrible in itself, but at the beginning, God in his mercy removes the effects of the early plagues, and there is limited long-lasting damage. However, the effects of the later plagues are disastrous, and Egypt is is described as being ruined. Remember that the plagues would have stopped the moment Pharaoh had simply agreed to let the people of Israel go out into the desert and worship God. They would have stopped. Think about it. If he hadn't been so stubborn, his country wouldn't have been destroyed. All of the oldest sons in Egypt would have lived even his own son wouldn't have died. The teaching point is clear. If God is arguing with you about who has ultimate control over your life, learn the lesson quickly before the lessons get harder. How many times in my life have I persisted in my stubbornness and ignored the voice of God? So there are arguments and also the severity of the plagues increased. And thirdly, The nine plagues were chosen to undermine the power of Egypt's false gods. Gods like Happy and Hecate, Kepri, he was one that had the head of a fly, 
and other gods were targeted and, and shown to be totally false. The overall purpose of the plagues is that the Egyptians would know that God is the Lord and that there's no one like him. This is repeated time and time again. And number four, there is a clear structure and sequence to the plagues. They are not random events. The plagues come in three series of three plagues, and we're going to find repeated phrases and a clear pattern that divides the plagues into these three sets. But the outcome of each set is different. So please turn in your Bibles uh, to Exodus chapter 7, and we will consider the first three plagues. So Exodus uh, chapter 7, uh, and you'll notice on the screen that some of the phrases will be highlighted, uh, sort of golden color uh, as we go uh, through it. So chapter 7 and verse 2, the Lord is speaking to Moses. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of this land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Now, series one begins with the first plague, which is the water uh, turned to blood. Verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die and the Nile will stink. And, Egypt, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. Verse 20, Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile and all the water in the Nile turned to blood. And the fish in the Nile died and the Nile stank so that the Egyptians could not drink the water from the Nile. There was blood throughout the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house and he did not take even this to heart. The second plague, the frogs, chapter eight. Then the Lord said to Moses, go in to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go and they that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile will swarm with frogs that shall come into your house and into your bedroom and onto your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and into your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on your servants. Verse six, so Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt but the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up out onto the land of Egypt. Verse eight, then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people and I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 12, so Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Pharaoh cried, and, sorry, and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, the frogs died out of, in the houses, the courtyards and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. The third plague, gnats. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. 
And they did so, and Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So series uh, one of our plagues and the title defiled, the water turned to blood, the frogs and the gnats. So let's look at some of the key phrases to find out the structure of this series of plagues. The the key phrase that starts each series uh, of plagues is this, go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. That uh, verse or that wee phrase is repeated time and time again. We've just read it in uh, chapter seven, verse 15, and it happens uh, every time a new series of three plagues is, is starting. And the pattern of each series is also the same. First, God tells Moses to go and warn Pharaoh, and he does that about both the first and the second plague. But then the third plague in each series comes without any warning to Pharaoh. It's not surprising that God deals with the Nile, targeting it with the first plague. The Nile was, was known as the father of life and the mother of all men. It was considered a manifestation of the God happy. The Nile meant everything to Egypt. It brought food and water and wealth. However, just 80 years beforehand, there had been a genocide of Hebrew baby boys who were then thrown into the Nile. God's chosen people had been brutally killed. And now, years later, it was God who moves to turn those same waters into blood. The fish died, they couldn't drink the water, and the Nile stank. The water had been defiled. Hecate was the god of fertility and sexual prowess. Hecate had the head of a frog. From the beginning of creation, God created man, a man and a woman to be married and to enjoy intimacy within that union. In many situations, that loving intimacy became defiled in the ancient Egypt, just as it has become defiled today. God therefore sends a plague of frogs. The land was covered with them. They came up into the houses, even into their bedrooms and into their beds. And Pharaoh pleads to God to take away the frogs, which all die and are gathered into heaps which stank. The earth has been defiled. And then plague three is gnats. But in other Bible translations, they are referred to as lice, which is probably a, a better term. This is, all, this is when you all start uh, scratching your heads. About 15 years ago, when Irma and I were living uh, in Bolivia, we were part of a medical center and we worked as dentists. And quite often we would go into remote areas of the countryside and do dental extractions. One particular weekend, we were invited uh, to a village uh, in the foothills of the Andes Mountains. We set up the dental equipment and quite a few people turned up uh, for treatment. I was busy doing an extraction uh, of one uh, particular uh, patient that turned up and I was standing beside, uh, behind him, a little boy probably about eight years of age. The tooth was starting uh, to loosen when I got a nudge uh, from Irma and she had this look of horror on her face. I hadn't a clue what I had done, what I'd done wrong, but with her finger, she focused my attention downwards to the hair of this little boy that I was standing behind. It was literally crawling with head lice. I'd never seen the like of it before. He was totally oblivious to the fact he had lice in his hair, but it was absolutely stinking. 
The only good thing was that with my hair density, there was a little risk of cross-contamination. Now here he is in the photograph with his light shampoo in his, on over his head with a plastic bag over it. And he even has his little tissue in his hand to bite on after his tooth extraction. The lice in Plague 3 came from the dust of the earth. And it says they were on man and beast. The people and the animals had been defiled. The overall theme of Plagues 1 to 3 is defilement of Egypt. What happens when a nation or society shut God, shuts God out? Well, the first thing is that it becomes defiled and unclean. If we reject God's rule over our lives and over our nations, if we reject his order, society begins to rot and stink. Take note that the Israelites didn't escape the stench and the effects of the defilement that was taking place in their land. I'm sure they were horrified by what was happening. In the middle of these trials, they had to hold firm to their God, to honor him in the midst of it all, and to journey towards a deeper relationship with their God. As Christians today, we face a similar challenge to remain close to God in a society in which we live where many things have been defiled. As students in school or university, in our workplace or in our home, keep close to God. Don't live a rotten life, but one that is filled with the aroma of Jesus Christ, an aroma that others should notice the aroma of Jesus who has purified us from all sin. This morning, I am deliberately avoiding any comments about Pharaoh's response to the plagues as Danny will tackle this next Sunday. But I do want you to notice the magicians. They are able to mimic plagues one and two with their secret arts. However, in chapter eight, verse 18, they tried to produce lice by their secret arts but they could not. It's true that Pharaoh and his magicians were skillful, but their power was limited. God was infinitely greater. Perhaps at times you feel that things, the things you have to deal with are just too much. Temptations, trials, disappointments with what has happened in life. There's a danger that we attribute every problem in life to a spiritual attack. That can be something that's very dangerous. But it is important to remember that as Christians, we are in a spiritual battle. First Peter chapter 5 reminds us we need to cast all our anxieties and cares on the Lord Jesus because he cares for us. The next verse says we need to be watchful because the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour Therefore, we are called to remain firm in our faith. God is so much greater than every other power. Remember that. Meditate on the glorious words of Romans chapter 8. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor, uh, nor angels or rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If the first uh, three plagues focused on defilement, then series two, plagues four to six, crank up the impact as things are ruined. So turn to uh, chapter eight, uh, verse 20. This is the fourth plague the flies, and we will see our series starting phrase again at the start. It's highlighted in gold on the screen. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me or else if you will not let my, my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants, and your people, and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies, and also the ground on which they stand. 
But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came swarms, great swarms of flies into the houses of Pharaoh and into the servants' houses. Throughout the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. So Moses went out, this is verse 30, sorry. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to God, and the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Chapter 9, there's a warning again here for Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses and the donkeys, the camels, the herds and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of, of all that belongs to the people of Israel will die. Verse 6. And the next day the Lord did this thing, all the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. And finally, the sixth plague boils. And there's no warning for Pharaoh. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses threw it in the air and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. <clears throat> when I was uh, in my teens, uh, I loved to go fishing. And one summer, uh, my older cousin invited me on a river fishing trip in the south of Ireland. We had a great time uh, and actually managed to come uh, to catch uh, some fish. Part of the process was to mix up a bucket of ground bait. It was basically breadcrumbs that were mixed together with maggots. And then you catapulted it uh, into the river uh, and uh, to try and attract the fish into that area where you were, were fishing. And we went uh, to one river uh, for the morning, uh, and then uh, after a while we decided to get into the car, which was my uncle's, and move to another river uh, for the afternoon. What could go wrong? Uh, the problem was we had no lid for the ground bait bucket. So after a short journey, we spent our afternoon fishing and then went home. And uh, the car was safely returned to my uncle and all our stuff was removed from the boot, or so we thought. A few days later, Uncle Norman opened his boot and out flew a swarm of flies. Obviously, the maggots that had been in the bucket had escaped and were now turning into flies. And this went on day after day, and in a way, his car was totally ruined uh, by this infestation. The plague of flies in this passage was so bad that it says that the land was ruined by the swarms. The animals are ruined in the fifth plague. Horses, donkeys, camels, herds, and flocks are all wiped out and die. And in the final plague of this section, the health of people and animals is affected by awful sores to the point that it says the magicians couldn't stand before Moses because of their source. These plagues are on another level. 
But I want you to notice a difference in this series. First, uh, chapter 8, verse 22. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there. Chapter 9, verse 4. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. 9, verse 11. For the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. One of the reasons that these plagues form a group is that for the first time a distinction is drawn between the Egyptians and the Israelites. The land of Goshen, where the Israelites lived, was free of flies. Their livestock remained healthy, and only the Egyptians were covered in boils. I wonder how the Egyptians felt to be set apart. Were they relieved, protected, in awe of God's mercy? Or were they tempted to be smug, a bit superior, like they had got it sussed? From the beginning, the people of God were called to be a blessing to the nations around them. But often, they separated themselves from others thinking themselves better and turned away from them, leaving these people in darkness. Peter describes followers of Christ in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, like this. But you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. As believers, we have received incredible mercy. We have been rescued from lives ruined by sin, and we are now God's very own possession. How do we react to God's mercy? Do we bow down in worship with overflowing thankfulness? There is nothing for us to be arrogant about as Christians because it all comes from Christ. Because we have been called out of darkness into wonderful light, we have so much to share about the love of Jesus with our friends, our colleagues, our family, and those we meet throughout life. Pharaoh witnessed the difference that God makes in people's lives but he could not accept God. God continues to speak into this world that's ruined by sin. And one of, the day, one of the ways that he does that is through our witness for him, our testimony of the goodness of God. We can be witnesses by following God's commands and living lives that are characterized by order and purity. A stable Christian home that displays godly values and harmony is a great argument against a society that wants to get rid of family values. As a local church, even though trials press in against us, we must faithfully seek to follow Christ, to teach his word, and to bring hope to many people. God argued through the plagues. God showed that when society rejects him, and people live self-sufficient lives, the result is a defiled, ruined uh, world. Our lives can, however, be totally transformed through repentance and by accepting Jesus as Lord of our lives. Maybe it's time to stop arguing with God and to simply trust him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for these chapters, um, these arguments of God uh, to Pharaoh, a man who had a stubborn heart against you. And Father, we realize that you continue uh, to speak out uh, and to challenge the way that each of us live our lives. Father, we realize that our lives have been ruined uh, by sin, but we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that he achieved on the, at the cross. We thank you that he uh, paid the punishment uh, for sin and offers us 
uh, forgiveness and acceptance, offered us, offers us freedom uh, from sin and shame, Lord. We thank you for him this morning. Help us uh, this week as we go uh, into this week, Lord, to be witnesses for you, uh, to shine light into darkness as we uh, follow you, as we live lives uh, that uh, honor you. Help us uh, to do that well as we seek to serve you. So we commit uh, the rest of this day into your hands and we pray your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, that was a, a great reminder of the danger of living life without God, of, of, of a life that cuts God out of the picture, and also the challenge for us as Christians then to, to stand out as light uh, in a world that's dark. Uh, we're going to close with a final song, Only a Holy God. Uh, we're going to stand to sing that together, and then our service will be over, but do hang around. Uh, we have tea and coffee and refreshments in the cafe, and we'd also encourage you to come back this evening for our new series uh, that's starting in Matthew, so do come back for that at 7 p.m. this evening.